So the second talk um, is uh, on comprehensive evaluation of mutual information analysis using a pair evaluation framework by Carolyn Wittnell and Elizabeth Oswald, and Carolyn is going to give a talk. Good morning, uh, my name is Carolyn Whitnell. The title of my talk today is a comprehensive evaluation of mutual information analysis using a fair evaluation framework. And this is a joint work between myself and Elizabeth Oswald at the University of Bristol. Um, please do forgive my use of notes. I'm sure I would give a much more interesting talk if I came up here and just said the first thing that came into my head, um, but I'm just not sure it will be interesting in the right sort of way. Um, so most of the talks in this section are to do with what is leaked during a protocol and how to control or minimize it. Um, our work relates more to the question of what to do with what is leaked. Um, that is, once we have some side channel measurements from a particular scenario, which analysis tools can be used to successfully extract secret information and uh, how can we begin to decide between these tools so as to make the most effective attack possible. I will start with some background information which equally serves as motivation for our research. And I will then present our methodology for comparing side channel distinguishers, um, after which I'll describe two distinguishers in more detail and uh, show how our framework applies. And these two distinguishers are mutual information analysis and its predecessor, correlation DPA. So in the context of differential side channel analysis, um, a distinguisher is any statistic which is used to compare um, side channel measurements with hypothesis dependent predictions in order to uncover the correct hypothesis. In a key recovery attack, this is usually in relation to an exhaustively searchable set of subkeys. Suppose, for example, that the power consumption of a device as it performs um, a computation uh, is partly dependent on the known input and the secret key. The remaining power consumption is independent of the data and behaves as random noise distorting the signal. Since the inputs relating to the measurements are known, um, the attacker can first compute the outputs of the target function as they would be under each key hypothesis. He then uses some model, such as the Hamming weight, which he hopes is a good approximation um, for the true data-dependent power consumption. The theoretic values of the distinguisher under each key hypothesis depend on the true underlying distributions of the leakage. And in practice, since these are known, um, the attacker estimates the distinguisher values, uh, producing a vector which might look something like this. And the important thing to note here is that the correct key is distinguished um, by a margin of about uh, two standard deviations from the nearest rival hypothesis. The success of an attack depends partly on the choice of distinguisher um, and how well it can be estimated. But it also depends on the leakage scenario, which is made up of three key components. Firstly, the target function. It is known that DPA attacks work best against those functions which are most um, especially designed to be cryptographically secure, such as substitution boxes, um, where small changes in the input produce large changes in the output. Secondly, the true form of the data-dependent signal and how well it can be approximated by the attacker. And thirdly, the size and nature of the random noise, which actually has a twofold effect. Um, it's obvious that large amounts of noise will increase the practical difficulty of an attack as estimation becomes less precise. But we'll see later that noise also has unanticipated implications for the underlying theoretic values of the distinguisher. So the two distinguishers we'll compare in our paper are mutual information and its uh, predecessor, the correlation coefficient, and I'll go on to describe them shortly. But first, I want to talk more generally um, about how to make meaningful comparisons between distinguishers. A popular and desirable metric is the number of trace measurements needed for an attack to be successful. However, this depends not just on the choice of distinguisher, but also on the choice of estimator. Um, that is the procedure used to estimate the distinguisher values from the data. And this causes two big problems in attempts to compare distinguishers. 
Um, there can be many different approaches to estimation, and outcomes have been shown to be highly sensitive, um, so that it is hard to make like-for-like -like comparisons between distinguishers themselves on such a basis. And moreover, um, the statistical methods used to predict the sample size required um, need you to know, the, know or, or to be able to approximate the sampling distribution of the estimator, um, which is only possible in very special circumstances. And without the sampling distribution, the best an evaluator can do is to perform experiments um, with simulated or measured traces. Our alternative approach, uh, we, we, we concentrate on theoretic outcomes, um, which bypasses altogether the confounding problem of, not, of estimation. Um, so rather than analyzing estimated distinguishing vectors from practical experiments, uh, we directly compute the true vector values for a variety of well-defined leakage scenarios. Of course, comparisons made on such a basis do not directly translate to um, practical comparisons because different statistics carry uh, different estimation costs. But certain characteristics of the distinguishing vectors make them more or less um, easy to estimate with enough precision to isolate the correct key. And this ensures that our approach is practically relevant. As such, we concentrate on three features of distinguishing vectors um, which most contribute to its estimatability. The first needs very little explanation, um, the ranking of the correct key vector, uh, sorry, the ranking of the correct key in the attack vector. Um, and obviously, for an attack to stand a greater than random chance of um, isolating the correct key in practice, it must be able to isolate it in theory. The second is a standardized measure um, of the distance between the correct key value and the nearest rival. And the larger this distance is in reality, the more likely it is to emerge from an imprecise estimate of the vector, which decreases the number of traces needed for estimation. And lastly, um, this third measure relates to the distinguisher's sensitivity uh, to limited information. If we only have inputs relating to a subset of the total input support space, um, how large does that subset need to be, on average, for the theoretic vector to isolate the true key? We reasonably expect that attacks requiring greater support space coverage will carry an overhead in terms of the sample size needed for estimation. So we now describe the two distinguishers we want to compare. Um, mutual information is most intuitively defined as a reduction in entropy on X, which is brought about by knowing Y. As a functional of probability distributions, estimation is inevitably problematic, um, and it is impossible to pin down a best estimator except under extremely restrictive assumptions. The empirical findings of the MIA literature have clearly demonstrated that DPA um, outcomes are highly sensitive to the choice of estimator. By contrast, Pearson's correlation coefficient measures the linear dependency um, between two random variables and is a function of moments, as shown here. Um, it is therefore much simpler to estimate, and the sample, coefficient, uh, the sample correlation coefficient is known to be a good estimator under a, variety of, um, a broad variety of assumptions. So unlike estimators for mutual information, uh, we can be relatively confident that it will produce the best outcome we can hope to achieve with a correlation attack um, on a given number of traces. And we also have lots of nice results about its sampling distribution, which facilitate a much more comprehensive analysis. So the reason we are so interested in MIA is that uh, mutual information is a measure of the total dependency between two random variables and can therefore be seen in some sense as optimal. And it's also been promoted as a generic um, approach which should remain effective even without a good power model. But empirical investigations have found that correlation DPA consistently outperforms MIA in spite of being, only being able to um, exploit linear dependencies. Many studies have focused on finding improved estimators for MIA, which do achieve the looked-for advantages over correlation DPA. Our evaluation framework allows us to take a step back and to ask whether and when this is even theoretically possible, a question which has been a little overlooked in the literature. So we compare the theoretic performance of three attack strategies, MIA and correlation DPA with a Hamming-Way power model, and MIA with an identity power model, which is often thought of as generic MIA. We first consider a baseline example of noise-free Hamming-Waite leakage of the first DES S-Box. 
This is a scenario which is particularly favorable to correlation DPA um, with a known Hamming weight power model. But even so, we can see that MIA has some sort of theoretic advantage, as it isolates the correct key from the nearest incorrect hypothesis um, by a substantially larger margin, achieving a nearest rival score, which is over twice the size of that of the correlation vector. It does, though, need more plain text inputs um, in order to distinguish the key, as reported in the last row of the table. So we take this observation, combined with the general high costs of estimating non-parametric statistics, to explain why it is usually less efficient in uh, practical comparisons. So the a priori reasoning is, in some sense, justified. It does isolate the true key more profoundly, just not in a way that can necessarily be exploited in practice. We now look at what happens in the presence of um, independent Gaussian noise. This figure shows the nearest rival distinguishing scores as the signal-to-noise ratio increases. The correlation coefficient is scaled by a constant, um, which depends only on the magnitude of the noise, so that the distinguishing score itself remains constant. But by contrast, the MIA scores um, have a surprising non-monotone relationship with noise, so that the distinguishing power seems to be enhanced by noise at some levels. And this type of sensitivity, uh, in which noise in the system can actually enhance signal in the DPA vector, um, is called stochastic resonance and can, in principle, occur in any nonlinear measurement system. We went on to test a variety of different leakage scenarios in search of instances where MIA displays a more substantial theoretic advantage. And one promising class uh, proved to be the Hamming distances from constant but unknown reference states. Again, commonly observed in CMOS logic and uh, so relevant to real life. Sorry, technology built in CMOS logic. Um, as an example candidate, we consider the Hamming distance leakage from a reference state of four. And we can see here from the table um, that in a noise-free setting, MIA with a Hamming weight power model has a distinguishing score of over four times that of the correlation attack and requires fewer than half the plain text inputs um, on average. The generic variant achieves an even larger score, but requires a marginally larger support than the Hamming weight attack. But is this theoretic advantage enough to imply that MIA might be useful in practice in such a scenario? To be considered practically meaningful, um, the observed advantages must first generalize in the presence of noise. And then if they do generalize, we must then explore whether they can be translated into practical advantages with standard estimation procedures. So these two figures reveal that MIA with a Hamming weight power model is not very robust to noise. Um, its distinguishing score actually falls below that of the correlation vector, and it also suffers a heavy penalty in terms of the required support size. By contrast, with an identity power model, um, there is a much smaller drop in distinguishing score and no change in the support size across the tested range. To test the distinguishes in practical attacks against simulated traces, um, we use the sample correlation coefficients and histogram estimation of the densities via the heuristic suggested in the MIA literature, which is to fix the number of bins as the cardinality of the power model image. So this figure shows the number of traces needed for the attacks to be successful as the signal-to-noise ratio increases. The five-bin MIA estimator with the Hamming weight model um, is unable to rival correlation DPA, even in scenarios, uh, even in noise settings, in fact, where it does have a theoretic advantage. However, um, the 16-bin estimator with the identity power model does display greater trace efficiency than the correlation distinguisher. Um, this is evidence that theoretic advantages can be turned to practical advantages under the right circumstances and with the right estimator. So as well as the obvious implications for CMOS logic, uh, we mention a scenario of particular relevance to DPA, which can be paralleled with Hamming, weight distance, uh, sorry, with Hamming distance leakage and is therefore similarly vulnerable to um, MIA. Dual rail precharge logic attempts to disguise the data dependency of the power consumption uh, by transmitting all input and output signals across pairs of complementary wires. And this approach is successful insofar as the, capacitance, sorry, as the capacitances of the wires can be balanced, uh, which is very difficult to achieve perfectly. We show in the paper that the expected form of such leakage, um, so 
to, to just clarify, any, any imbalance will result in some leakage, um, which is dependent on the data. And we show in the paper that the expected form of that leakage will in some way resemble um, the Hamming distance from a constant reference state, where in place of the state, we consider the bitwise difference in the wire capacitances. So this leads us to suppose that MIA might be a useful strategy for exploiting dual rail precharge leakage. And our reasoning is confirmed by some experimental results um, in the seminal chess paper on MIA, where generic MIA was successfully used against a dual rail precharge implementation which resisted correlation DPA. To conclude then, we have identified the limitations of experimental evidence as a basis for comparing attacks and instead considered theoretic outcomes in well-defined scenarios which are relevant to practice. We have thereby shown that there are scenarios in which mutual information has a substantial theoretic advantage and have confirmed experimentally that these advantages can be translated into practical advantages. And furthermore, we have identified an intriguing noise sensitivity in the MIA distinguishing vector, which resembles a type of stochastic resonance. We develop these ideas further in our journal article uh, down the bottom, uh, which includes some particularly interesting observations about attempts to develop um, near generic attacks for use against non-injective target functions. And that's all I have to say today. Thank you so much for listening, and uh, do feel free to ask any questions. So as, as you noticed, uh, this talk was very related uh, to the leakage resilient zero knowledge talk, more related than I thought. Uh, both of them use the word leakage extensively. So since we have lots of time for questions, I'm sure Caroline would be very happy to answer questions about either of the talks. Any questions? All right, so let's thank Elizabeth again, uh, Caroline again. <laughs>